No matter how you cut it, Norman Lear is a hit TV show producer and will go down in history as a legend for his work. I would call him innovative, cutting edge, progressive, and way ahead of his time in terms of the characters and storylines that he brought to the small screen in the 1970s and 1980s. But was he, at the very least, problematic on the set of Good Times when it came to how America's first nuclear black family would be portrayed on TV? Let's explore. Norman Lear was born in 1922. Before he turned 10 years old, he lived with relatives for a time while his father spent three years in jail from 1931 to 1934 for a get-rich-quick scheme gone bad. He flew 52 combat missions during World War II and then set out to make it in the entertainment world. When he started, it wasn't smooth. His first attempt was failing as a Broadway publicist. After that, Norman Lear moved to Los Angeles in 1950. There, he started his writing career with a song parody he sold for $40. In 1963, he teamed with Bud Yorkin to produce variety shows and movies. The two men bought the rights to a British comedy that had been airing since 1965. It was called Till Death Us Do Part. Well, it debuted on CBS in 1971 as All in the Family, starting the greatest run any sitcom producer has ever had in the history of television, which included but certainly is not limited to Maud, Good Times, Sanford and Son, One Day at a Time, and The Jeffersons. These hits don't even cover half of his resume. I have just mentioned six of his shows, and there was a time when he had nine shows running on TV simultaneously. Biting social and political humor was his trademark. Norman Lear brought many firsts to the television screens of American families. The first to talk about abortion on TV. The first TV show to talk about menopause. The first to tackle opposition to the Vietnam War on TV. The first TV show to feature the sound of a flushing toilet, something about which Lear is very proud. That happened in 1971 on All in the Family and was very taboo at the time because it was considered in poor taste to see or hear a toilet in any manner on TV. And the final first that I will mention, TV's first black nuclear family, which is where we will stay for this video. After making history with TV's first black nuclear family, Norman Lear and the stars of Good Times, John Amos and Esther Roll, fought over whether the show put Black Americans in a bad light. Before we saw Esther Roll as the wife and mother on Good Times, Esther Roll was a featured actress on Maud, the show that starred Beatrice Arthur. From Norman Lear's own perspective in his memoir called, Even This I Get to Experience, he thought of Esther Roll as performing in the bush leagues while being groomed for the majors. Going with that, he gave her more to do and her character more background, revealing that she was married and had children. And then, on one episode of Maud, he introduced her husband, Henry, cast then by John Amos, as he would later be on Good Times, but not with the same name and not without a fight from Norman Lear. We will get there, stick with me. Florida and Henry, who would become James, clicked loudly together and CBS saw quickly, add children and stir slowly, and they will have another very funny family show on their hands. Good Times was a spinoff of a spinoff. All in the Family was the first, from there, we got the Maud spinoff. From Maud, we got the Good Times spinoff. To be very clear, 
This was a spinoff show intended for Esther Rowe. Norman Lear pulled in Eric Monte and Mike Evans to write the series. Mike Evans is the actor who played George and Wheezy's son on All in the Family. The two writers had conceived a family of five for the show. The mother, the father, and three kids. Well, Norman Lear seemed to think that his comedy would be funnier without a father. And this was the first fight about the show before it ever got off the ground. When Norman Lear approached Esther Roll with the script for the show, she refused to take the job unless they included a paternal figure in the series who would be Florida's husband and the father of her children. Esther Roll took this very personally. She was the 10th of 18 children born to her parents in Pompano Beach, Florida. And she grew up in a family where, despite the difficulties, her father was always present. In 1978, Esther Roll told Ebony Magazine, I only took my part with provisions that Good Times would have a complete black family with a father image. I had a good father. I wanted the characters to portray a family as mine did, unquote. So can we just pause here for a moment and really give Esther Roll some credit? Yes, we love to talk about how important The Cosby Show was, but the fact of the matter is that Esther Roll walked so that Felicia Rashad could run. Esther Roll came on to the TV scene at a time when there were only two black families before hers. Julia, which featured a single mom, and Sanford and Son, which featured a single dad. So I can only imagine how hard it must have been for her and the fight that she had to face just to get an entire nuclear black family on the TV screen. And that deserves a moment of recognition in my eyes. It wasn't like there were 12 other shows that she could have gone to. And she talked to those producers knowing that she could easily have been replaced or the whole show just scrapped. So I can't say it enough. Kudos to Esther Roll. May she rest in peace. In that Ebony Magazine article, she went on to say, quote, I told Lear and the rest of the producers, I wouldn't compound the lie that black fathers don't care about their children, end quote. Eventually, her demands were met, and John Amos, who had made appearances in Maud as Florida's husband, was brought in to play the role of James Evans, the father of Michael, J.J., and Thelma, and she made it very clear that her husband should also be the father of her children, the same man. I think that it gets overlooked, but that was a very big stance to take at that time. Well, Florida gets a husband, so now we can record a show. First filming, according to Norman Lear, another quote from his memoir, the actors all scored in their roles, and when the show aired, it was an immediate hit. Not only with Blacks, as some predicted would be the case, the viewership was 60% white. It was heralded as a breakthrough by the press generally, and the Black press especially. The actors were proud and excited, and it was a kick sitting down each week reading the new script. Quick question. Let me know if you think that the show having 60% white viewership may have had anything to do with economics in the country at that time. Were TVs affordable enough for most black families to have them in their homes in the early 1970s? Please tell me your thoughts in the comment section. But now that we get past the husband issue and we have a successful debut, we have a few more bumps in the road with Norman Lear pushing narratives onto TV's first black nuclear family that just do not sit well with the stars of the show. Storyline problem number one. Thelma, the beautiful 16-year-old daughter of James and Florida, had a boyfriend she cared about who started to make some serious sexual advances on her. Physically, she had every desire to sleep with him, and a girlfriend was telling her that she should, but Thelma was fighting it and wanted to talk it over with her mom. 
When Esther Roll heard about it, she refused the script. No point in even reading it, she said. The last thing we want this family to deal with on our show is teenage sex. The fact that Thelma ultimately came to the same conclusion as her mom made no difference. It is morally wrong. Let's not even discuss it, Esther said. There is enough that's morally wrong on TV, not on my show. Well, Norman Lear put his foot down and went on with the episode as planned. For him, it was a success, and I'm sure that the network saw it the same, and that must have been reflected in the ratings. In Norman Lear's words, quote, That didn't go down as well with Esther and John as I would have liked, but it did give them considerable pause. Thelma's Problem, which was the name of the episode, went well and we got a lot of mail from individuals, schools, and institutions that found the episode helpful in opening up a normally difficult subject for discussion, end quote. So again, a win for the network, but not necessarily a win for the image of Black Americans, which was clearly very important to Esther Roll and John Amos. Because you see, while Norman Lear was getting letters of praise from individuals and schools, Esther Roll was getting mail too, from her church, from her pastor, from other black churches, from other black pastors, from other white churches and other white pastors and some fundamentalist institutions expressing their discontent with the subject of teenage sex on TV. There would be other storyline issues that would cause a clash between Norman Lear and the leading man and leading lady as the seasons went on. But nothing would prove to be more divisive than what I call the problem of JJ. This is Norman Lear's perspective on it. A quote from his memoir. Jimmy Walker, as the older son JJ, was a big problem to them. Now that's them being John Amos and Esther Roll. It started early in the series when he ad-libbed Dino Might about something that pleased him. It was funny, the audience howled, and he repeated it with the same reaction, a sure laugh. At the next reading, the cast found it in the script. Let me say that I loved JJ, the character, and Jimmy, the actor. In reality, they were not that far apart. The actor seemed to have shrugged off what was known as the black man's burden. I believe that was the way that he chose to deal with it. Physically, he could have been a cartoonist's vision of Ichabod Crane, a funny man to the eye, to which he deliberately added to the ear. The man, the boy was just plain funny. Dino Might became a running joke. And the character, JJ, John and Esther began to believe was running away with the show." End quote. Now, Norman Lear released his memoir when he was 92 years old. I think that by then, with all of the black culture that he must have been privy to just in working on the set of Good Times, surely he must have been able to come up with something to call Jimmy Walker other than the boy. I mean, how many times on Good Times have we heard what Michael Evans had to say about the word boy? Even though JJ became the breakout star of the show, producers thought that the real star would be Ralph Carter, who played Michael Evans. Ralph Carter was appearing in the Broadway musical Raisin when he caught the eye of Good Times producers. They liked him so much that Norman Lear bought out the remainder of his contract just to have him to be able to appear on Good Times. Remember seeing this in the opening credits? Well, that's what that meant. Like what you're hearing so far? Press that thumbs up and subscribe. JJ was the buffoon figure on the show. In contrast with Thelma and Michael, who were highly educated and had huge professional goals for themselves, JJ didn't have a job and often acted like a fool. The turn that the show took when the writers began adding more jokes for JJ and he became the center of the series, drove both John Amos and Esther Roll to speak up. 
Amos was eventually fired due to creative differences with the producers. While John Amos admired Jimmy Walker as a comedian, he was unhappy about the amount of attention the JJ character was getting versus the other two children. He talked about it in an interview with the American Archive of Television. He said, quote, Michael aspired to be a Supreme Court justice and Thelma wanted to be a surgeon, but all of the emphasis was on JJ and his chicken hat and him saying dynamite every third page, end quote. John Amos also admitted that he wasn't the most diplomatic person in those days and that the producers got, quote, tired of having their lives threatened over jokes, end quote. John Amos apparently complained one too many times because one day he received a phone call from Norman Lear advising him that he was considered to be a disruptive element and telling him that his services were no longer required. To explain the absence of John Amos, the first episode of season four showed Florida receiving a telegram informing her that James had been killed in an automobile accident while en route to Mississippi, where he just landed a new promising job. And in case you did not know, that is why James was killed off from the show, for taking a hard stance against JJ's buffoonery. And I will admit, that TV death is the first one that I can remember seeing. Even though I saw Good Times as reruns when I watched the show, that death was devastating to me. While John Amos was fired, Esther Roll, on the other hand, quit the series in 1977. Here's what Esther Roll thought about JJ. Just like John Amos, she was disenchanted, to say the least, about the way that JJ's character was evolving. She said that Good Times had become a clown show, and because of her values and the lack of compromise from the executives, she decided to walk away. In a September 1975 Ebony Magazine interview, she said, quote, he's 18 and he doesn't work. He can't read and write. He doesn't think. The show didn't start out to be that, end quote. Still not feeling great about it almost 20 years later, in 1994, she told the Sun Sentinel, quote, young black boys don't need to see a 19-year-old boy acting like a jackass and having a big game at it. It's the wrong image, end quote. That was only JJ. There were still more issues. With James written out of the script by dying in a car accident, Esther Roll did not like the idea of having a new love interest, Carl Dixon, played by Moses Gunn, in the very next season of the show. So, fed up with the turn the series had taken, in the midst of season four, she demanded two things from Norman Lear, a raise and better scripts. Well, she got different scripts. Norman Lear responded to her request by asking the writers if they could write scripts that didn't include the mother. So Florida married Carl, who she already expressed that it didn't feel right for her character to be with, and the couple moved to Arizona, where the weather would be better for his newly diagnosed lung cancer. Yeah. In that same Sun Sentinel interview, Esther Roll said that she returned to Good Time's final season in 1979 when Norman Lear allegedly threatened to cancel it ahead of time because, quote, I didn't want to see that many young black people be put out of work, end quote. Give it up for this phenomenal woman. Norman Lear totally disregarded the requests of John Amos and Esther Roll to put the TV family in a better light. He justified his actions in his memoir by writing this. I reminded them that we were doing a family show and that I too grew up in a family and had made families of my own. I too was a father, a son, a husband, an uncle, and a grandson. In the way that they all interact, I hadn't detected that much difference from one race to another. Still, their hypersensitivity to how they were perceived 
by social forces that were not of one mind, cost us all dearly. We were losing some unique subject matter and a degree of reality that made for our show's freshness. While Norm and Elise saw the request to not carry on with certain storylines as interruptions that were holding back the progress of the show, he was not understanding the gravity of what these storylines meant to the actors who had to portray them, and it didn't seem like he really cared. What was ratings to him was a much bigger picture for Esther Roll and John Amos because, in a way, they were given the task of carrying the image of all Black Americans on their shoulders. Norman Lear didn't seem to understand that, since Thelma Evans is the only Black teenage girl on TV, that her thinking about having sex is just too much, even if it was a reality, because there was no other Black girl on TV to counterbalance that narrative. Norman Lear basically says that he just saw people as people, and we all go through the same struggles. And that is true to a point, but some of the stereotypes and issues that he fought to lay on the Evans family would not have landed as hard on a white TV family because there was so much other representation of white families as being good and virtuous and upstanding. The Evans family was the only black nuclear family on TV, so all of the stereotypes and situations in which Norman Lear wanted to place them, that was just it. That is all that people saw of a black family on TV because there was no other show to turn the dial to in order to see another black family. Kudos to Esther Roll and John Amos for being able to see the bigger picture, even while being in the midst of it all that was going on. Kudos to them for wanting to be more than famous and paid, but having a consciousness about their images. It would have been nice if Norman Lear could have tried harder to find a way to not have dismantled TV's first nuclear black family just because the father wanted his son to stop acting like a fool. But I won't act like everything that came from the show was bad. Good Times gave us our first opportunity to see Janet Jackson in a major acting role. She was supposed to maintain a very childlike look as Wilona's adopted daughter. She'd begun maturing at an early age, so the wardrobe department had to bind her chest with strips of gauze before each taping. Janet was only 11 years old when she started on the show and has since stated that she was unhappy during her entire run. We won't blame that on Norman Lear. Good Times also gave us our first Black American teen girl crush in Bernadette Stannis, who played Thelma Evans. She was the only young Black woman teen star on TV at the time. The first. She achieved bona fide teen sweetheart status thanks to her exposure on the show. And she was in steady competition with the Jackson Brothers and Diana Ross in the Hollywood Gossip Columns. She became a poster favorite and regular magazine cover girl and still looks amazing today in 2020. Though Jimmy Walker wasn't a favorite among his fellow cast members, his friends in the comedy world loved him and he didn't forget his friends once his television career took off. In fact, he hired a couple of struggling comedians whose names we now know to write material for his stand-up act back then. Ever heard of David Letterman and Jay Leno? Yeah, Walker even got a small guest spot on Good Times for Leno during season three. Remember the VD episode? What are you here for? Uh, I got a, a cold. Oh, that's funny, everybody else is here for VD. <laughs> Years later, after Good Times had been canceled and Letterman was the star of Late Night, Jimmy Walker could still phone Letterman at any time and get a spot on his show. Jimmy told the AV Club, Obviously David Letterman is a big star now, he's a billionaire, but David told me, you're my friend, I'll always have you on my show. 
till the last breath in my body goes. We appreciate Norman Lear for all of the innovative shows and groundbreaking characters that he brought to our TV screens, but I can't help but wonder how much better Good Times would have been had he not done so much to make life on the set of Good Times so bad. Well, everyone, that's it for this video. I hope that you enjoyed it. Thank you so much for tuning in to the Ty Said What Ty Said channel. Please leave a thumbs up and comment so that we can get a discussion going. And share this video on all of your social media, especially your Facebook. That really helps me out a lot. And subscribe and hit the notification bell so that you can know when my next video is ready for you. And if you don't like what I'm saying, but you love it, feel free to hit that applaud button just below your video screen there and send me some donations, donations, donations. Yeah, baby. See you on the next video.